Welcome to Speak Your Mind by Climobilize. My guest for this session is Derek Jensen. Derek is a lifelong campaigner for a better world. He is the author of 28 books, including the one that opened my eyes to our current misguided approach to environmentalism, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. Hi, Derek. It's great to have you with us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Let's start with a variation of the question that's behind you. What, if any, are the risks that suddenly a strong populist, environmentally focused government will rise to power, promising a better future, as they all do, and start mandating changes that, while they may be necessary, are well beyond the scope of the campaign and that ultimately leads to severe impacts on our individual rights? Well, if we break that question down, what are the odds or what are the risks? Well, let's go with what are the odds of a president being elected or some someone coming to power who actually cares more about the natural world than about the growth of the economy? I think the chances are very low um, in any case. What are the odds of someone using that rhetoric? to seize power, I think the odds are very high. And it's something that we actually see quite often and we've been seeing in many ways for decades. And in order to talk about that, I wanna talk about uh, something Robert J. Lifton talked about, which is something called claims to virtue. And he said, before anybody can commit any mass atrocity, they have to have, they have to convince themselves and others that what they're doing is not harmful, but instead actually beneficial. And um, they have to have what he called a claim to virtue. And this is true pretty much everywhere. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the Nazis who he was studying, you know, they didn't, they weren't committing genocide and waging aggressive war and committing mass murder. They were purifying the Aryan race and taking the land that was their own Lebensraum. They, they had themselves convinced they were the good guys. And I'm not saying they're right, of course. I'm saying that they have themselves convinced. And this is true in almost every circumstance that, you know, I, I don't know about you, but never once in my life have I been a jerk. By which I mean that every time I've been a jerk, I've had it fully rationalized. You know, we all uh, we all have our individual claims to virtue. But So my, my point here on the bigger scale is that we see this, for example, with the Forest Service all the time, United States Forest Service, that they used to just say, we need to cut the trees for for jobs, or we need to cut the trees for, for housing. But environmentalists were kicking up fusses about that. And so they came up with other reasons that they had to do it. Like in back in the 90s, the forests are in a state of ecological collapse. Therefore, we need to cut them down. It doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't matter because it's a claim to virtue. And... Uh, they say the forests are in danger of burning, so we need to cut them down. The forests are getting killed by beetles, so we need to cut them down. So all these excuses. And the point has, has to do with climate change is, I don't remember the number of states, I think it's 12 states have already put in place or are putting in place uh, basically waivers that make it so uh, individuals or communities cannot prevent uh, solar or wind, uh, industrial solar, or industrial wind facilities going in. And the those locals are losing their rights over this already. And that, as we try to talk about in Bright Green Lies, and we can talk about this today if you want, but um, wind and solar don't actually help the planet in any case, for a number of reasons. They power the economy some, but a wind energy facility does not actually help right whales and does not actually help coho salmon. It's that they're, and again, I can, we can spend our entire time talking about that if you want. But my point here is that uh, that's a claim to virtue where local, we can use the word authoritarianism if we want, but we can also just talk about community sovereignty is already being undercut for under that 
uh, claim, which again, I would, I would say is a false claim. Um, so there's that. And, and part of the problem, part of the reason that I think that we won't see people who are honest to goodness, environmentalists, people who care more about the natural world than they do about the economy is that it's almost impossible to gain a real position of power in this society if you aren't serving the machine, if you aren't serving the whole capitalist enterprise. I mean, so let's say I ran on a platform of, I want to contract the economy in a rational fashion somehow, and we'll start with getting rid of golf courses and retractable stadium roofs and some of the excesses. And then we'll, we'll, you know, do a sort of managed crash. And I'm running against somebody who promises uh, free Wi-Fi for everybody. And, you know, who who is going to get the campaign money flowing into their coffer? It's not going to be me. Um, so and, and that's just on a superficial level. There's other levels we can talk about as well. But so I think the danger is people taking environmental rhetoric and using it for authoritarian purposes or for community sovereignty destroying purposes. Um, I don't think actual environmentalists uh, I, don't, I don't think them actually gaining mass power. I think it's less likely now than it was in in 1964, 1972, uh, when they passed things like the Wilderness Act, that Wilderness Act, the Endangered Species Act, or any of those could never be passed today. I think it's just a tool that somebody would use. Uh, and that's kind of the essence completely. of the question. So let's move on to, um, when we look at a sustainable future, the, the mainstream tells us that there are some elements to that sustainable future. And, but we were talking earlier, there's an element that's a given to that sustainable future that simply doesn't fit, that we are trying to fit into this box. Um, maybe you could elaborate on that discussion we had. Well, what do all the so-called solutions to global warming have in common that are put forward by the mainstream? What they all have in common is they take industrial capitalism as a given, and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. And that is solving for the wrong variable because the health of the natural world has to be primary because without a living planet, you don't have any economic system whatsoever. And for an economic system to, to be sustainable, it has to not harm the planet by definition. Because let's say you have the, so let's say the, the land base is at 100 units of health, whatever those units are, and then every year it goes down by one, well, in 100 years, you're down to zero. And it, it seems very clear to me that the way to be sustainable is to actually improve the habitat on its own terms to actually at the very least not harm it but actually make it better and we can say wow that's that's not what beings do beings exploit their surroundings but how do you think the world got to be so rich and fecund in the first place it's by salmon and redwoods and salamanders and frogs and everybody living and dying and by by their processes of living and dying they make the habitat better that's and that's how you can live in place is by not harming the land base. But the problem is that we have an extractive economy. And a way to think about this is, is I mean, let's drop the environment for a second and just talk about you have a neighborhood and uh, everybody's living okay and they're living within their means and um, you know, we're, we're dropping off. They're living within a capitalist system, even, you know, so they, you know, they go to work and they get money and they, they're saving, they're doing okay. But then you have one member of this community, one part of the neighborhood who has access to everybody's bank accounts and keeps draining them. And they're going to do great. They're going to, you know, they've, they've got five cars and they've got 
mansion. Uh, everybody else, not not so well. And that's what we're doing to the planet is we're, here's part of the problem on how we, we're, we're addicted to this way of life. And we can talk more about this if you want, but one of the sort of truisms about addiction is a lot of addicts don't change until they hit bottom. You know, you always hear about the junkie or the meth addict or, and, or, and I mean, I've known some of them. I had some of them as friends and a lot of times they don't change until they really bottom out. And um, the problem with being addicted to stealing from others is that you're not the one who hits bottom. Everybody else does. It works great for you. And, um, and as Daniel Quinn said many, many years ago, part of our problem is that we have been made dependent for our very lives on the system that's killing the planet. And so what was your question? Oh, what do they take? Yeah. What do they have? The problem, the problem is that we all generally accept that this culture is a given and that capitalism is a given. I mean, Bill McKibben talks explicitly about how what he's trying to save is civilization. He doesn't say he's trying to save little brown bats. He doesn't say he's trying to save Arctic terns. He's, he's explicit about this. Or Lester Brown, plan B 2.0 to save civilization. It's never to save right whales. And it's not just there, but this is uh, this this in, in, in more than infuses, it uh, suffuses, it suffuses everything about the culture. And I mean, here's a, here's a, a very small example, but it's it's important that in all of my books, I've had to fight the editors in order to say the tree who the tree who lives outside my window, as opposed to the tree that the tree that. And one reason this is important is because how you perceive the world affects how you behave in the world. <clears throat> and so many indigenous people have said to me that the most fundamental difference between Western indigenous ways of being is even the most open-minded Westerners generally perceive listening to the natural world as a metaphor, as opposed to the way the world really is. And they perceive the world as consisting of objects to be exploited rather than other beings to enter into relationship with. And how you perceive those beings affects how you act toward them. And if, I'm not saying that you can never, you know, cut down a tree or you can never kill a tree, you can never, but what I'm saying is when you do, you are taking a life that is as valuable to them as yours is to you and mine is to me. And so part of the problem is we don't perceive, first off, we don't perceive the natural world as consisting of, of, other beings in, with whom we can enter in a relationship. Another part is we think that we're smart enough to manage a forest and we think we're smart enough to manage the ocean. And we think we're smart enough to be able to, Oh, what's going to happen if we throw a whole bunch of uh, pylons down into the, just on the offshore area off Massachusetts or off Humboldt Bay and uh, then put up a bunch of windmills. What's going to be the effect of that? Oh, it'll be okay. There'll be, as the Forest Service loves to say about timber sales, no significant impact. And I love the line. I, I heard it from David Ehrenfeld, but somebody else said it before him. Nature's not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we're capable of thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a couple things. One is that that we we value the economic system more than we value wild nature. And we value the goodies it brings us. The economic system brings us more than the goodies that nature has. And the second part of the problem is I think we need to have a lot more humility when we approach natural world. I mean, I can sum all this up just by saying we need to practice the precautionary principle, which is if there's a chance you're going to do harm. Okay, here's the, I'll say one more thing about this, which is I actually became an environmentalist because I'm fundamentally conservative, by which I don't mean socially conservative. I just mean, I think it's a really, really stupid idea to wipe out runs of salmon that you might need to eat tomorrow. I just think it's fundamentally stupid to conduct open air experiments where you bathe the world in endocrine disruptors and let's see what happens. I just, I just think, it's, I think it's a bad idea. And on a really small scale, the land where I live has, has a little pond. There's no fish in it. And soon after um, my mom and I moved to this land, so why don't you put some goldfish in the pond and just see what happens? 
And I said, because it's a lot easier to not put goldfish in than to take them out if they cause problems. And so I think we don't, we do have a precautionary principle in place, but it has to do with protecting corporate profits. That if there, if there's a chance that some action will stop corporate profits, God, we got to look at this four or five times to figure out what we should, what's the best course of action. If there's a chance that something's going to harm the last wild herd of buffalo, well, let's go ahead and see what happens. We'll just do it. Um, what's going to happen if we put nerve agents all over the planet in terms of pesticides? Ah, let's see. Let's try it. Um, so you you may, you mentioned quite eloquently the connection that we don't have with nature. Or at least most of us don't have. Uh, walking in a park is not nature, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's nice to be around the park because it reminds us of how much we are connected to nature, but it's not the real nature, the natural world. Um, so how do we affect that, that social change? Can we affect that social change that gets people to, well, love, love the natural world enough to care for it? Or does their uh, reliance on this capitalist system, which is fundamentally um, um, directed to destroy the natural world, you know, in your estimation, what path is most likely? Where where, where are we heading? Well, great question. All your questions are great. And the, the first part about this, I just want to, to point out that um, what is GNP? GNP really is a measure of how quickly the living planet is converted to dead objects. Um, because the tree right there has no value until it's cut down and sold, made in two by fours and sold. And a living school of fish has no value until it's turned into fish sticks. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the health of the system is measured by how quickly it's killing the planet. And that's the first thing. Second thing is, the bad news is, I don't believe there's going to be a voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable oil living. And that's why I wrote my book, Endgame, is I would ask, I would have 500 people in the audience, and I would say, do you believe this culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living? Nobody ever said yes. One person raised his hand, and they looked around, and he said, oh, voluntary. No, of course not. Um, which means, I, I agree with him, that we will be living sustainably someday, or we won't be living, by definition. But will it be voluntary? I don't think so. And the next question becomes, if you don't believe the culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sustainable way of living, what does that mean for your strategy and for your tactics? And the answer is we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't talk about it. And the reason we don't talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that we have some hope that there'll be a magical transformation. And I'm not in any way suggesting, oh, just get depressed and don't do anything at all. I'm absolutely not suggesting that. So many of the environmental activists I know are basically, well, it's like my friend John Osborne says that his job during his lifetime is to, as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure some doors remain open. And what he means by that is we can't predict the future, but we can say that if bull trout are gone in five years, they're gone forever. If Selkirk caribou are gone in five years, they're gone forever. If Kootenai sturgeon are gone in five years, they're gone forever. If this piece of land is cut down, it will not, it will not, well, this is, this is an old growth anyway, but if a piece of old growth is cut down, it won't come back for 500 or a thousand years. It, in, in, in a reasonable sense of time, it's gone forever. And so I think it's really important for us to protect every piece of wild nature. And and how do we, and I think the most important thing for us to do, as I said earlier, is to transfer our loyalty away from the system that doesn't even serve us well. And I mean, yeah, yeah it brings us lots of goodies, but but we only have one life that we know of. And when I was in college, I had this sort of odd habit of asking people if they liked their jobs. And about 90% said no. And it just struck me as really odd. Like, 
the vast majority of people spend the vast majority of their waking hours doing things they don't want to do. And that's, that's how the system's kind of working. And, you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't bring stuff to us. I, I like, you know, watching baseball as much as the next person, probably more than a lot of people. And that doesn't alter the fact. And also modern medicine has saved my life. I have Crohn's disease, which would have killed me many times over without modern medicine. And, Never mind that Crohn's disease is a disease of civilization. Leave that aside. But, but but that doesn't alter the fact that you don't judge a system by how well it serves you. But, but the, the system needs to be judged by how well it serves the entire biotic community. And, and, and so, again, we have, on one hand, we have a lot of inducements to... Uh, you know, Mephistopheles comes promising us this Faustian bargain. And we get, I mean, if you go with this Faust, it's, well, all the Fausts, you know, Christopher Marlowe's Faust, doesn't matter which one, Andrew Gibson, they're all, I mean, it's, it's, it is the story. It is the story of, of Western civilization. I will give you everything in exchange for your soul. Oh, and the planet too. Anyway, so what do we, we, we do? We have about five minutes. So that's, okay. that's where I want to transition to. Um, what do we do? Well, I want to say one we... more thing about this. One more thing sure. very quickly, which is that the good news, I left off the good news till last. The good news is that every child who is born has an inherent biophilia and it really has to be taken out of them. And I mean, I mean for the system to continue. So the the point is that we're we're not facing, we're not fighting biology, we're fighting culture. We're fighting, mm -hmm. I mean, for most of human existence, humans didn't destroy the place. We made a number of very bad choices, such as agriculture, such as the beginning of cities. But for almost all, there's there are currently 8 billion humans on the planet, somewhere in there. And I looked up once how many humans have ever existed. And I was thinking it was going to be like 15 or 16 or something. 80 mm -hmm. billion humans have ever existed. Mm -hmm. That's through, through the last couple of thousand years. And most of them... Um, didn't destroy their places. That is, and it's not because they were magical, you know, had some super special connection because when, when you introduce certain technologies, they will change society very quickly. That's a whole nother subject. But my point here, the good news is that we have it in us to love, love wild nature. And we have it in us to, form relationships i mean most people when they when they see a redwood tree or when they see a bear they're fascinated they they're happy as long as it's not like throwing garbage around and making as long as it's not making a mess for them it's like wow that's magnificent and you know mess for them could be a whole other discussion we could have anyway sorry what's your last question well we we, we have about four minutes what I would like you to shed light on is what you're getting at. Okay, so as E.O. Wilson said, we have this biophilia hypothesis and we we, we are connected to nature. Um, how do we affect a social change so that politicians are compelled to do what they can to protect the natural world? And if they don't, they have no chance of pursuing that profession as a politician. And I know you've done work with Deep Green Resistance, and I just would love to hear you tell the audience a little bit. I know there's a lot to it. Um, what what we can do? How did, how can we do it? And I know there's no rule book, but well, I think that there is. We can all. I think we can all agree that there are a lot of problems with Western medicine, the way it's practiced. But I think we can also well. I don't know if we all agree, but I certainly agree that one of the things I love about Western medicine is, as again, my friend John Osborne says, who's an environmentalist and a doctor, um, the correct diagnosis is the first step toward proper treatment. And I think one of the things that we can do is we can simply tell the truth and we can state explicitly. There's a, there's a line I love from a thriller novel I read that is the first one through the door always gets shot. And 
somebody has to say, you know, this way of life is inherently unsustainable. And uh, there are there have been other ways to live. And there have been ways where people, the land where I live, I'm not saying that they were perfect. I'm not saying they were noble savages, but the land where I live here, the Talawa lived here for 12,500 years. And they didn't destroy the place. The place was full of salmon, full of, was was still, and interestingly enough, because it's there was so many salmon, the population was about half what it is now. Population actually, you know, there are some places where they can only sustain like one person per square mile, one human per square mile. But here, the population was like thirteen or fourteen thousand. It's only like thirty or forty thousand now, um, and they were living. They lived here for twelve thousand years. And anyway, so the first thing is, I think we need to attempt to honestly address our situation. Do does wind and solar actually help bats? Does it on? Does it actually help uh, grass? Does it actually help trees? Um, what does Jevons' paradox mean about uh, and about energy usage? Jevons' paradox is as energy becomes more available, people use more energy. So actually, wind and solar are not replacing, as we're seeing, are not replacing fossil fuels at all. Very little, like one tenth. Ninety percent of it is just going into the grid. We're using more and more and more of it. And I think we need to address that directly. Just. I mean, think about, so I, I think what we need to do is we need to have discussions like you're having here. And we need to tell the truth as honestly we can be, as we can. And maybe this will be a good thing to end on unless you have something better, which is Jeanette Armstrong, an Okanagan Indian and writer, and I knew her back in the 90s. We we're good friends. And she, her people have this great conflict resolution method. It's called Enalkin, E-N apostrophe O-W-K-I-N. And what it means is I challenge you to give me your most opposite perspective to mine so I can increase my understanding. It doesn't mean I have to agree with you, but it means let's put the cards on the table and let's let's look at them. So let's talk honestly about, like I said, the winds of, of the, the effects of winds and solar on right whales. Let's talk honestly about um, population. Let's talk honestly about when we talk about population. Oh, we always think of little brown babies in Mexico City. But when Russia or Japan has negative population growth, they give sex holidays so people can go home and try to have more babies. I mean, that. So let's talk about the growth imperative in capitalism. I just want to, I think the first step is to just talk as honestly as we can and to do things like you're doing. So you're doing a great service just by, by, I mean, I don't know if, how much time do I have? 30 seconds. Okay. One of my most famous lines ever is every morning when I wake up, I ask myself whether I should ride or blow up a dam. And what I'm getting at with that line is that, yes, I think discussion is absolutely necessary is it sufficient? No. So yes, we have to have the conversations that you're having here. Do conversations by themselves accomplish anything in the real world? No. So we have to have the conversations and then we have to get off our butts and we have to, the way I always sign my book Endgame when people buy it is find what you love and defend your beloved. And whatever you love, it's under assault. And doesn't matter whether it's wild nature, whether it's independent bookstores, whether it's long form discourse, um, whether it's women, whether it is uh, desert pupfish, whether it's coho salmon, and just get up and start defending it. I think that's a great place to end. Um, Derek, thank you so much. Uh, you shed a lot of wisdom on this conversation. I had no idea you wrote 28 books, um, but uh, I hope that we can do this again and we can delve into um, one of these issues uh, more fully because um, you can't have a conversation about these big challenges in 28 minutes, um, but it's a start. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was fun. Your questions are great. Thank you very much.